I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings by Maya Angelou, Chapter 2. When Bailey was six, that's her older brother, and I a year younger, we used to rattle off the timetables with the speed I was later to see Chinese children in San Francisco employ on their abacuses. Our summer gray pot-bellied stove bloomed rosy red during winter and became a severe disciplinarian threat if we were so foolish as to indulge in making mistakes. <clears throat> Uncle Willie used to sit like a giant black Z. He had been crippled as a child. And hear us testify to the Lafayette County Training School's abilities. His face pulled down on the left side as if a pulley had been attached to his lower teeth <laughs> and his left hand was only a mite bigger than Bailey's. But on the second mistake, or on the third hesitation, his big overgrown right hand would catch one of us behind the collar, and in the same moment would thrust the culprit towards the dull red heater, which throbbed like a devil's toothache. Let me see if I can fix that. Is that better? We were never burned, although once I thought I might have been, when I was so terrified I tried to jump onto the stove to remove the possibility of its remaining a threat. Like most children, I thought if I could face the worst danger voluntarily and triumph, I would forever have power over it. But in my case of sacrificial effort, I was thwarted. Uncle Willie had tight to my, held tight to my dress, and I only got close enough to smell the smell the clean, dry scent of hot iron. We learned the times tables without understanding their grand principle, simply because we had the capacity and no alternative. The tragedy of lameness seems so unfair to children that they are embarrassed in its presence. And they, most recently off nature's mold, sense that they have only narrowly, narrowly missed another of her jokes. In relief at the narrow escape, they vent their emotions in impatience and criticism of the unlucky cripple. Mama related times without end and without any show of emotion how Uncle Willie had been dropped when he was three years old by a woman who was minding him. She seemed to hold no rancor against the babysitter, nor for her just God who allowed the accident. She felt it necessary to explain over and over again to those who knew the story by heart that he wasn't born that way. <laughs> In our society where two-legged, two-armed, strong black men were able at best to eke out only the necessities of life, Uncle Willie with his starched shirts, shined shoes, and shelves full, shelves full of food was a whipping boy and butt of jokes of the underemployed and underpaid. Fate not only disabled him, but laid a double-tiered barrier in his path. He was also proud and sensitive. Therefore, he couldn't pretend that he wasn't crippled, nor he could he deceive himself that people were not repelled by his defect. Only once in all the years of trying not to watch him, I saw him pretend to pull himself and others that he wasn't lame, to pretend to himself and others that he wasn't lame. Coming home one day from school, I saw a dark car in our front yard, I rushed to find a strange man and woman. Uncle Willie said later they were school teachers from Little Rock. That's Little Rock, Arkansas. Drinking Dr. Pepper in the cool of the... Cool of the what? Morning? Night? Summer? Cool of the store. I sensed a wrongness around me like an alarm clock that had gone off without being set. I knew it couldn't be the strangers, not frequently, but not enough. Travelers pulled off the main road to buy tobacco or soft drinks in the only Negro store in Stamps. When I looked at Uncle Willie, I knew what was pulling my mind's coattails. He was standing erect behind the counter, not leaning forward or resting on the small shelf that had been built for him, erect. His eyes seemed to hold me with a mixture of threats and appeal. I dutifully greeted the strangers and roamed my eyes around for his walking stick. 
It was nowhere to be seen. He said, uh, this, uh, this, uh, my niece, she's just come from school. Then the couple, you know how children are these days. They play all the day, day at school and can't, can't wait to get home and play, 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 play some more. The people smiled very friendly. He added, go out and play, sister. The lady laughed in a soft Arkansas voice and said, well, you know, Mr. Johnson, they say you're only a child once. Have you children of your own? Uncle Willie looked at me with an impatience I hadn't seen in his face, even when he took 30 minutes to loop the laces over his high top shoes. I, I, I thought I told you to go. Go outside and play. Before I left, I saw him lean back on the shelves of the Garrett Snuff, Prince Albert, and Spark Plug Chewing Tobacco. No, ma'am, no ch children and no wife. He tried to laugh. I have an old mother and my brother's t two children to l look after. I didn't mind his using us to make himself look good. In fact, I would have pretended to be his daughter if he wanted me to. Not only did I not feel any loyalty to my own father, I figured that if I'd been Uncle Willie's child, I would have received much better treatment. The couple left after a few minutes, and from the back of the house, I watched the red car scare chickens, raise dust, and disappear towards Magnolia. Uncle Willie was making his way down the long, shadowed aisle between the shelves and the counter, hand over hand like a man climbing out of a dream. I stayed quiet and watched him lurch from, side, from one side, bumping to the other until he reached the coal oil tank. He put his hand behind that dark recess and took his cane and the strong fist and shifted his weight to the wooden support. He thought he had pulled it off. I'll never know why it was important to him that the couple, he said later that he'd never seen them before, would take a picture of a whole Mr. Johnson back to Little Rock. He must have been tired of being crippled as prisoners tire of penitentiary bars and the guilty tire of blame. The high top shoes and the cane, his uncontrollable muscles and thick tongue, and the looks he suffered of either contempt or pity had simply worn him out. And for one afternoon, one part of an afternoon, he wanted no part of them. I understood and felt closer to him at that moment than ever before or since. During those, these years in stamps, I met and fall in love, fell in love, sorry, let's start it again. During these years in stamps, that's the town, I met and fell in love with William Shakespeare. He was my first white love. Although I enjoyed and respected Kipling, Poe, Butler, Thackeray, and Henley, I saved my young and loyal passions, passion for Paul Lawrence, Dunbar, Langston Hughes, James Weldon Johnson, and W.E.B. Du Bois, Litany at Atlanta. But it was Shakespeare who said, when in disgrace with fortune, in men's eyes, end quote. It was a state with which I felt myself most familiar when in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes. I pacified myself about his whiteness by saying that after all, he'd been dead so long it couldn't matter to anyone anymore. Bailey and I decided to memorize a scene from The Merchant of Venice, but we realized that Mama would question us about the author, that we'd have to tell her that Shakespeare was white, and it wouldn't matter to her whether he was dead or not, so we chose the creation by James Weldon Johnson instead. End of chapter 2.